This is the convergence, convergence of thought, convergence of divergent thought, convergence into dialectic thought. Okay? Good enough reason to be here, I think. But we are activists. <laughs> we are doing it. We don't just do the talk. We're talking about doing it. We're doing it because we're talking about doing it. And here we are. Hi, Comrade Storm. How Hi. are you? I'm doing fairly well, things considered. You know, we're in a pretty fucking harsh time at the moment, but it's all about needing to stay headstrong and push forward. How are you doing, Comrade? Ah, I know that we want to slice uh, slice Biden apart and all that, you know, like he's, even though, you know, he's putting on a nice face now, nice mask, you know, pop, left populist mask this time. And while he's doing, you know, 500 pound, 500 pound bomb approval policy with respect to the genocide in Gaza, you know, like, okay, leave him to the side for the moment. And let me ask you, what is happening in the not so great Britain that you inhabit there? Um, we need to know. We need to know. God. The whole world is waiting. So the Labour Party is coming to power. Yes. Um. So I guess that means that like we're all liberated and that capitalism's over. You know, we can all we can all rest easy that the British Empire no longer exists. Um. I'm sure Keir Starmer, oh, leader didn't... of the, oh, didn't know that. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Labour Party is the supposed left wing option is targeting the trans community, pushing for World War Three, um, uh, big supporters of the Zionists. They have a Zionist uh, lobbyist in their party at the moment. Um uh and uh or a think tank leader, sorry. I was a think tank leader who was a big, big fan of the Zionists and also like um like wants a nuclear war with the way he talks about stuff. Oh. Um, this he's like Wes something. I can't remember his last name. Hmm. And so um, right now we're in turmoil and like, unlike the French, we don't have this like United front that can just like fucking actually do anything about anything. Uh, hmm. We kind of have a, had a problem where, I mean, something kind of was building out of the Palestine shit, but then it never got picked up off the ground. Hmm. um like uh we were like with the palestine struggle we were doing really well with like trying to struggle against issues but be the universities like they're doing good jobs by starting occupations but now they're shutting them down uh themselves the moment they get the slight inclination that they might talk about the issues hmm. it's that is creating a uh, vapidness in the movement and then there's like less people turning up to the protests in birmingham and it's getting mm. really depressing and so mm. like we really should have scraped together some form of a united front out of the palestine fucking protests for that issue and yeah. for stopping fascism because these things are all interlinked palestine you know we won't be free until palestine is free well, mm. if our building of that freedom comes forward, well, it also is about trying to combat imperialism. And so mm. we needed a united front and it didn't form. And now we're in a situation where the struggle is kind of hemorrhaging a bit and it needs to get its shit back together, especially mm. now Labour's one, because Labour is dangerous. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what about the... Uh... The monarchy, you know, is the Labour Party going to abolish the monarchy, you know, because we have this monarch, you know, in Canada here, you know, like, and in Quebec, we even have King Charles III, you know, is supposed to be our king. And our, this king can actually dismiss our governments like they did in Australia. They have power, you know, and mm -hmm. they exercise their power, weekly meetings with the prime minister and all that sort of shit. You know, they give direction and they indicate, you know, what, uh, what you know, our lobby organization private lobby organization that controls the government basically you know if they want to so well i mean they literally are the ones who have to deliver the black rod for government to have any power like in the colonies they have to get the governor to shut it down but here every single time they start up parliament they have to ask the king for permission to open the uh, the, yes. the seat uh, of power yes, and yes. um what's it here's the funny thing i'll say 
Margaret Thatcher is more of an anti-monarchist than Keir Starmer. Oh, wow. I saw him bow his head to King Charles III. He did it when he entered into the room and, you know, when they were supposed to sort of, you know, be received, you know, to to be called upon, you know, to form a government. He comes in, steps into the room, one step and bows his head down. <laughs> you know, you know there's one thing to say about Jeremy Corbyn. He won't um, bow to a monarch. Uh, it's not like he'll show disrespect and just be an asshole, but he's not going to sit there and pretend to be some like royalist either. He hates yeah. the monarchy yeah. and like was really explicit about it. And he got so much shit for it. And it's like, well, what, what do, you, do you expect? He's like a fucking like uh, an old school label lot. And for the little shits that they can be, they don't like monarchs. Like <laughs> it's kind of written on the tin. And it's like, then you have Keir Starmer who's trying to ride off of um, Jeremy Corbyn's uh, hope and change. He just changed it to change. He got rid of the whole <laughs> part. I'm not even joking. I actually, okay. wait a minute. I have the flyer somewhere. Where, where is it? Did I bid the, it? The oh, previous version. Have... Uh, incredible. So I had this posted through my door. Yes. So they got rid of the hope part. We, we we're not allowed to have hope anymore. We're only allowed change. Okay, um, it's been private. Hope has been privatized. Yes, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Look and at the, him. Look at goofy. Yes, it's Sturmer. Yes. Oh my. Oh, my, my. Wait, my, what my, was my. it? Is it Cash Sturmer? Yes. Here. Present name. That's yeah. a very German name. Like it's kind of yeah. anglified, like in a yeah. way, but like because like it feels more like it should be Sturmer, not Stammer. But I guess they both might just be German names, and I'm just a weird, stinky Northern European, Northeastern Europe, Northwestern European. I'll get it eventually. I'll I'll say all the parts of the compass till I get there. Um, mm -hmm. Northwestern European that doesn't know the. Uh, these standards the Germanians uh, abide by. Um, but, you know, Anglo stuff. I mean, they're all a bunch of Normans at this point. Of yeah. all of them, I'm just being hyperbolic. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. But Corbyn got elected as an independent and he can't be expelled from the House of Commons like he was expelled from the Labour Party. Okay. So Sturmer, you know, has got a problem. He's got, he's got this, uh, this uh, mouthy uh, little shit. Nem that won't go nemesis. Away. His nemesis is right there facing him. You know, like so. Okay, that's going to be very interesting. Okay, well, he might, he might be able to fucking like do what he did during the Thatcher days, because like in the in the Thatcher days, Corbyn got like essentially popular because he would like yell. Uh -huh. like the way he was at like Boris Johnson and all that on the podium uh -huh. he'd do that but he was like much less like withdrawn and reserved the motherfucker just sort of blew off like a fucking uh, an atom bomb like you know uh -huh. so hopefully we can see some young Corbin come back yes I'd like to see that because I've only seen him you know talking like a like a Christian minister or something like that you know that's his his persona you know, and then finally he's trimmed his beard. His you know, like, okay, thank you. You know, like I don't have to look at you know the, the scraggly old man who's dying beard. You know that he had before. So he's he's you know taking shape. Okay, that's good. But what about Biden? What do you think about his speech yesterday? Oh God, let's take a slice of Biden. We need like a theme song for this bit because it's not like it, it's, it might as well be like a, a part of every episode at this point. Now, time for a slice with Biden on the um. Which talk show do we go for? The <laughs> <laughs> uh, Convergence Forum here, you know, takes a slice of Biden, and what do we see? Oh, left populist now. He's going to raise the minimum wage. He's going to tax the greedy billionaires who are funding his campaign, of course. But never mind. 25%, you know, like, and who knows what, you know, like exemptions for whoever, you know, donates to his campaign. But, you know, there's a lot of, you know, donors to the Democratic Party that are withholding their donation to the particular campaign of Biden. They want to have somebody else chosen. But the only one, you know, that he could really choose, you know, who would win the election for sure is Bernie, Bernie Sanders, you know. <laughs> <laughs> 
if they really wanted to win the election, that's what they would do. You know, even though Biden is, you know, as you know, like a, a, a you know, in, a cognitive enough, you know, to be able to, you know, think independently and you know, understand what he's saying. That's not a problem for me. You know, maybe he has, you know, like a back brace or something. You know, so he looks like a robot. But you know, like that's just bullshit. So. Um, you know, Bernie, Bernie would win, you know, but Bernie is yeah. so quiet, you know, like he's like a mouse, you know, like, like, uh, he's like a lab mouse, you know, being used, you know, for experimentations, you know, or something like signed that. signed his deal in the last one. I swear, like, I have no evidence for this claim, but him dropping out of the race and then, like, Biden, like, winning and making him the, the fucking secretary for labor. Yeah. Like the literal head, like the most powerful man in the country for specifically labor issues was Bernie Sanders and still is Bernie Sanders. Yeah. And like, that's not summer. I had expected Biden to just give on the normal regs, you know? So yeah. it does feel like some underhanded deal went on there. And like, you know, I think as well that you rightly mentioned is that like, I think a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that oh biden has dementia and if he does like i'll just say it must be early on because the guy is definitely still cognitive he's yeah. just like senile yeah. possibly going through the early stages of dementia that's the closest yeah. he is to it because yeah. he still knows he still knows like how to think he still knows how to operate he knows who he is it's not like he's fucking thinking he's like 20 years younger all of a sudden so like you know he's um He's there, but he's like a senile old man who's in one of the most stressful jobs you could be in. He needs to just retire. Like he's gonna, he, he's gonna destroy his brain if he goes for another four years. He'll learn the hard way, like Reagan did, if mm. he if he manages to go for four more years. Yeah, and like yeah. that's if he could win the election, which just doesn't feel right to me. Like I think he's gonna get obliterated. Uh, well, not obliterated. Sorry, I think he's gonna lose because, like, I think it's actually gonna be a really close election if we're gonna go by what the sort of zeitgeist is saying regarding uh, voting in yeah, America right now. Yeah, in the polls. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, it's surprised. like a one percent possibility of change on both sides yeah, within the margin of error. Yeah, I'm surprised, you know, because I thought Biden, you know, was was really being, you know, uh, soured by uh, in the in the mind of the American public, you know, but. Trump scares a lot of people in supporting Biden. But Biden, you know, like what kind of an alternative is a uh, is genocide Joe, you know, going, you know, to be considered. You know, there's it's yeah. not possible. It's not possible, you know, to deal with either of them. You know, even if it means, you know, that that you know, Trump is, you know, wanting to bring in a fascist regime, so what? So is, you know, the in effect, you know, what Biden is doing, you know, the police are all militarized. One thing now he's changed in his left populist program, which seems to be like a concession to Bernie Sanders, is he's talking about you know labor union uh, rights, the, you know facilitating labor union organizing. So it seems like he's making this concession in order to keep Bernie out, and to keep uh, Bernie out as a contender. You know, um, it's an interesting situation because do you know one of the weirdest things is is Biden has actually been one of the, like, best presidents on unions. And that's such a weird thing to say. Um, like, he already did kind of make a concession in that direction. Now, he's still been awful on unions in other ways. Like, what happened with the rail union is an example of that, banning strikes because maintaining the because they have such few railways a railway strike actually really heavily cripples the american economy and uh -huh. so rather than building more railroads they just they just did the brute force thing of banning strikes and it's like motherfucker build more railroads and then you know pay your rail workers properly and they're not gonna fucking want to strike maybe i don't know like <laughs> it's it's almost like there's demands that strikers make that are like actually pretty reasonable and easy to meet and like you know you could just i don't know do the demands and then the strike doesn't last very long uh -huh. <laughs> Unless they're revolutionaries, because then they'll just turn the strike into another issue that needs to be a challenge. Oh, yeah, you know, like if you don't settle <laughs> within two weeks, we're going to turn this into a general strike and a revolutionary assault. You know, that's it. That's all. <laughs>
God, that's what we need for Palestine. It needs to be general strike. It needs to be... No, there's um, another strategy which is more important even. And that is we have to take on the war production because that's enabling Israel to continue the war, okay? Because Israel doesn't have the war production. They get it, you know, it from the American you know, uh, war production that has subsidiaries even in Canada that's doing war production, you know, for, for shipments, you know, and that's the way the United States wants it, you know, because they don't want to, you know, give the money to, you know, the billions that they give to Israel. They don't give it to Israel. They give it to the war production, uh, uh, war war machine in the United States of America. The money stays inside the United States of America. And it's the bombs that are sent to Israel, you know, as uh, and it's called, you know, uh, it's called money, but it's not. It's bombs. That's all, you know. The bombs are the new currency for the United States of America. You know, the big... Currency is 500 pound. The super big ones are the 2,000 pound bombs. And then the others, you know, like who knows? But, you know, it's like a, a currency, you know, with denominations as well. It's most incredible. Hmm. If with how large workforces, like, you know, because they slot people in at different times. So you tend to have a lot of people working at a lot of the main like arteries of shit we need, you know, the service worker in the industry. You'll have like a lot of people doing like half time work uh, at a single place. So if um, and even with like people at a full hires, if you've got a place that's a larger institution, there's going to be a lot of people there. If we could get people while on general strike to have enough people to protect the the place from stopping the boss from pulling it with new workers, because I understand that's an important aspect of their strike and ensuring they maintain their power. Yeah, but then them divulging. I don't mean half, but a good chunk of people from every workspace to be a part of a twenty-four-seven occupation effort of the war production places. Yeah, in the essence of the encampments we've seen, we yeah. could shut this shit down in a month. Yeah, like Elbit was shut down. You know. Yeah, um, Elbit in my town was shut down. Um, yeah. What they did there is they just, uh, what they climbed on the roof and they poured blood down the facade of the building, you know, or <laughs> and put up a banner. They did something like that, got arrested for that, and then they got convicted of some minor charge. And uh, but Elbit uh, was shut down nonetheless. I don't know how, but you know they didn't want the bad publicity or something like that, so got shut down. It was easy. That's easy. Yeah. Yeah, we've but, shut down like uh, three or four out of like. Um... God, I think there's like 10 installments in the country. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So all of these war production factories can be shut down. And I, I think there's, you know, a couple that were even burned down. <laughs> so that sells that. But I uh, mean that that's um, you know, uh something people might actually want to start considering because, like, you know, we can't just keep playing nice all the time. The Birmingham encampment the other day got raided by the police. Yeah, what they're doing is illegal as well, but uh, that's for uh, those capable of doing so to consider. So, but what's it? We had um, because like now we're in a really, really like fucking messy situation because uh, a lot of the other encampments have gone back to brunch rather than maintaining their power basis, and then encampments like Birmingham encampment are getting graded by the police. Yeah. And so, like, we're losing power basis here. So people need to, like, up the ante and get prepared to do more radical struggle. Um, I'm not necessarily yeah. calling for people to do anything violent. I just think people need to be more dedicated. This three times a month crap of protesting an Elbit place is just not good enough. Mm, yeah. I mean, you know, it got to be sort of uh, useless to go and participate in all the Palestinian-led demonstrations here in Montreal. The first six demonstrations, you know, finally the uh, independent Jewish voices came to demonstrate. But, um, and then the Turek Carter comes all the time, you know, so it wasn't really all that important for me to be there, you know. And, uh, so I went and set up our own demonstration, Jewish Bundes demonstration, right inside the Jewish community where it counts. Because outside there in public, okay, you know, the public is... You know, not convinced, you know, that the Palestinians are being genocided. Okay, that's settled. You know, so what more can you do by walking around like that? You know, it's not going, it's limited, very limited. 
So I went to inside the Jewish community. And even though I was alone, it didn't matter, you know, because when you crack that open space there, oh, as Leonard Cohen says, that's how the light gets in. And it certainly well, what's it? It's about like adding to a situation because those protests out on those streets as well, they're also massively important, especially because of the disruption and the fact that you can block arteries of mm. things if people yeah. were not so willing to just follow what the police says all the fucking time like i'm sick of that kind of happening with protesters oh, yeah. Yeah. but with um but it's also important that we do breach the neighborhoods as well and like really sort of get people to have to question like what the fuck is going on mm. wow mm-hmm. that's what they do inside of the uh Zion estate there the demonstrations they take over the big thoroughfares you know big junctions in the transport system shut it all down and uh so they get the attention of the government otherwise they would just be ignored even by the media they mm-hmm. would just be ignored yeah but no longer i don't know uh you know even the uh the uh israeli media is getting is getting uh more open there are articles that are like virtually anti-zionist articles that are published by the jerusalem post or the jerusalem times that i get uh, digital and how Eretz, you know just did a big expose you know showing how on October the 7th, there was the um, uh, Zionist military that was responsible for carrying out explicitly throughout the whole day, the Hannibal principle, the Hannibal uh, doctrine in which they, you know, in order to get to the, uh, to wipe out the the Hamas fighters, they would wipe out all the hostages that they were holding at the same time and they didn't care. And that was considered to be normal. No, well, what's it? They were, they were they were their, their way of committing to the Hannibal principle was by firing machine guns out the side of helicopters at crowds. So they weren't even just shooting the hostages; they were just shooting civilians. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So and that actually breaches the Hannibal principle in a way, but I guess to them it justifies it because they were as good as hostages anyway. As soon as they were surrounded by them, insert slurs. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and then and then they wiped out all of the vehicles and any vehicle that was moving, you know, they wiped out, even if it was, you know, uh, you know, some some freaks, uh, you know, tripping on ecstasy, trying to escape, you know, from from the uh, from the from the uh, bullets, and then they find that the perimeter of the whole place was blocked. The whole road system was set up with. Uh, with checkpoints, you know, by the Zionist military, they wouldn't allow any vehicle to get out. And any vehicle that approached, you know, was considered to be possibly, you know, Hamas fighter forcing, you know, some Israeli to drive the the car into uh, further uh, inside, you know, the state. <laughs> so they stopped them all, and they wouldn't allow any of the, you know, the the party goers, you know, to escape. And they would go back, meet up, you know, with more Hamas people, some of whom, you know, were so. Cr- were getting you know carried away and they were just shooting into the civilians but even though that they, they were they were civilians at the moment you know even though they were the, of the age you know to be soldiers but they didn't have any you know machine guns with them and uh, so they were equivalent to civilians and they were just being you know shot at that was you know mistaken you know, to be like, fair that as well is that like you know people don't tend to bring up the fact that israel was killing civilians but it's brought up that hamas is well to the palestinians no one there is technically a truly civilian i mean they, they actually the hamas did actually treat them as civilians but they're all in an, uh, a settlement that's what yes. people seem to forget is it happened in a settlement it didn't happen in like fucking it wasn't tel aviv it was like a settlement that they had not long built it was a pretty recent motherfucker and yeah from they, which the palestinians had been expelled you know in 48 and then 67 and, and 56 you know like and still to this way. day because they keep making new ones even though it's a yeah. it's fucking a breach of international law and they've actually been told by the un to stop so it, it, yeah. maybe you should try actually stopping them rather than just telling them i don't know like the un yeah. useful that being a America's bitch. Yeah. Brought to you by Raytheon. <laughs> oh my. So, but uh, there's much more information coming out. The helicopters, they used those Hellfire missiles and they burnt every vehicle that they could, hundreds of them, you know, and uh, <laughs> incredible, you know, that all these. And a lot of the party goers, you know, they were like 
pacifists. They were against the occupation, probably. But they were also probably soldiers. It's also messy, isn't it? There was a lot of Israeli chauvinism going on at that party. Like, so there was probably a lot of Israeli nationalists there because it was like celebrating like Israel's like, like uh, Anum, uh, essentially. It's, it's also so arrogant, you know, to put on a party on the border of Gaza that is being starved, you know, like in a fucking settlement as well. Like you're going to just start partying about fucking like the land you're taking like you know yeah uh, yeah right next to a military base as well they were right next to a military base they were on the path you know to the military base which was the uh objective of the hamas fighters (laughs) well once said they went there specifically just to take some hostages they just wanted a quick in and out um and then israel decided to turn into something crazy i'm still not gonna lie nothing is more badass than the way they fucking entered though we're just gonna fucking paraglide into your fucking event like (laughs) motherfuckers yeah yeah yeah. i saw a video you know early on you know at the party showing this this woman you know tall woman in a black bra and her uh khaki pants you know military pants she was soldier but she was there dancing, you know, probably tripping on ecstasy. And in the sky behind her are the paragliders coming in. <laughs> she doesn't even notice, you know. Oh God. Yeah. That, that that that's what one would actually call a TikTok masterpiece. Like imagine they just like watching someone's like live video and you just see Palestinian freedom fighters just <laughs> descending from the sky. <laughs> Probably that's where it came from. That's right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like you know, God, so arrogant, you know, the hubris, you know, the arrogance and the and the self sort of uh, self. Uh, what what is the word for it? Self lying, lying to yourself, lying to everybody else, and everybody knows they're lying, you know. But because everybody's lying, then it's okay because it's normal to lie. The ones who did become hostages, though, are having their, like, whole reality checked, because they know that Israel slaughtered people, though some of them have started being quieter, which makes me feel like they've been threatened, Um, because they watched the slaughter happen, you know, the hostages. I was reading one of their accounts about them talking about, like, bullets were flying either ways, but they, they were dead sure that their friends were not killed by Palestinian bullets and it was Israelis trying to kill the Palestinians. Mm. Um, And like, uh, what's it? And then when they were taken, they were treated with hospice. They were given the water that the Palestinians had short supply of. They did not have much water on their liaison as they were traveling. And Mm. they gave ample amounts of it to the people that they had captured they made sure that they stayed cool because it was a really fucking hot day as well like and they made sure they stayed fed they made sure they stayed looked after they made sure they didn't feel like that they were being like harmed or or terrorized or made to be feel uncomfortable in any way they were just guarded yeah Watch. they weren't raped there were no rapes no <laughs> there was none of that shit all the mutilation yeah. stuff and all that. But then the Israelis go and attack Rafa and fucking like mutilate children after burning them alive. It's incredible. The, 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 the worst image I saw was of a video in which uh, this dog was carrying away a dead baby in its jaws to, in a, to take it away to its excluded to be sick in a secluded place where we could eat it. You know, the the pets that were left behind are now eating the dead bodies. And I saw one human skeleton that was totally cleaned off. Every little bit of flesh, you know, just the skeleton was left with a whole rib cage, just lying there in the street. Incredible. This is what's happening to Gaza. And then some of the pictures, you know, of children who were emaciated no muscles left. I don't even know how they can stand up, but they can talk. But they're just skin and bones, literally. And you can see all the bones, all the bones underneath their skin. I mean, a lot of them have been like living off of um, boiled grass. Hmm. Yeah. So like, you know, that's the kind of, you know, anyone who's listening to this, you go tell me that you could go live a fucking grass soup 
Like, you go fucking think that you could survive that while being bombed, while being slaughtered, while being terrorized. The fucking Palestinian people are going through a kind of terrorization that we, uh, like, see in apartheid countries, Palestine being the most apartheid country in the world right now. It is the shit we see in settler colonies, Palestine being an ongoing uh, settlerization from the Israelis, the, 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 the European Jewish community that had like essentially betrayed their Jewishness to become white and start being colonial oppressors. Mm. Mm. And then you, you know, like this, the genocide that we're seeing now, is one to one Nazi genocidal tactics through mm -hmm. and through to the point that Netanyahu's um fucking specific ambitious fucking attempt to take over the Palestine uh, Palestine again in a 1967 push um the uh what's it they managed to at one point during this genocide be killing children faster than ever during the Holocaust. Hmm. Hmm. More children dying per day. And it's like, you, you know, people really need to like keep that into consideration as to why Palestine is as important at all moments. Why I am someone who gets really fucking like pissy about some of the people that either try and take a liberal middle ground position on it or people that don't see it as as something they need to dedicate uh the primary amount of their focus on at the moment or try and do the we gotta focus on our own backyard shit this is needing to focus on our own shit as too because if the Palestinian genocide is uh you know a fucking uh you know um uh fucking uh, to harm one of us is to harm all of us situation to genocide the palestinian people is a genocide that will be felt amongst the peoples especially the colonized peoples throughout the world uh, the irish struggle knows its nature of being tied to the damn near hip of the palestinian struggle and mm -hmm. like you know i won't let anyone fucking forget that mm -hmm. um this is like a test case for the world. Uh, as I mentioned to Steve one time, that if uh, this genocide is uh, tolerated, normalized, and becomes a precedent, then uh, why not, uh, you know, elsewhere? You know, when there's a revolt elsewhere, and uh, the revolt cannot be suppressed, and because, you know, the revolt, you know, is swimming in the fish, uh, uh, amongst the fish, you know, like the, the world are fishes swimming amongst other fishes, you know, as as Mao Zedong, you know, once said uh, in, a, in a different way, in a better way than me. But uh, in order to stop the revolt, then you get rid of all the fish, you know, in order to get rid of the fish, you know, that are in, re in resistance and revolt. So that's genocide. Genocide is a political tool, you know, in order to stop a revolt that cannot be stopped otherwise. That's what... Yeah. Um, is happening in, in Gaza. So now if the black nation uh, needs to revolt against uh, police brutality or uh, because of military occupation of the uh, black ghettos in all the American cities or something like that, that could happen under Trump. You know, well, if genocide is, is, uh, is normalized in Gaza, then it's uh, going to be used in the United States of America as well. Yes. That's, uh, that's uh, you know, the corollary. That's the logical corollary of what's happening in Gaza. Now, I saw one uh, Gaza man uh, speaking, saying that we Palestinians are in the, he didn't say vanguard, you know, but we're leading a uh, struggle against the most powerful of the world from the most weak of the world. And we are going to show how to do it and how to win while doing it. And we will make history here and now. He's talking about history. They're making history. You know, mm -hmm. the, Pal the, the Palestinians in Gaza, 
they're not sort of turning against uh, Hamas like you know, the Zionists want them to, you know, blaming Hamas, you know, for being bombed. They're keeping their focus on who is responsible for the occupation and for the genocide. So the Palestinian people as a whole have become revolutionaries. Now, if we're if one were to compare it, you know, to the Holocaust, the beginning of the Holocaust, you know, was a slow affair in which, you know, just bullets were being used, you know, you know, you know, all the local Jewish and Roman population would be herded into a forest clearing, told to dig a ditch. And then they were standing on the edge of the ditch and they were they shot in the head and they fell into the ditch and that was that. Okay, but took a lot of bullets and uh, the bullets could be used elsewhere. And the uh, German soldiers were getting squeamish, you know, because they could see, you know, the effects of what they were doing. Now, to make it more feasible into a whole campaign in the program, that's when they built the death factories, the death camps. Yeah. And who did the killing? Nobody. It was just the gas. And who got rid of the so bodies? Not the German Nazis. No, they wouldn't touch the bodies. That was dirty. No, it was the slaves, the, the Jewish slaves. slaves that were made, you know, to put the bodies into the crematoria. And why were they put into a crematoria? You know, in order to hide it. Because if they were buried, you know, the evidence would remain. The, yep. the bodies would remain. They wanted to remove all evidence of the existence of the Jewish people so that the Jewish people would be forgotten from history and they would make a pure, you know, nation state of Germans, all of whom are pure. Why are they pure? Because they're Christians. So uh, Christian because they're inbred, I would have been my... <laughs> <laughs> so what um the zionists are strategizing is you know just bombing away you know like that you know it's a very slow process it only kills yeah. them, only about 100 a day you know like a, you know one massacre per day you know it's not good enough what the nazis did is they, they would bring in a train carrying three thousand uh Ju jewish uh um at polish and then Hungarians, the Hungarians, you know, the Jewish Hungarians were the last to go under Eichmann. So 3,000, you know, would come in on a train. They come inside the camp. They would be divided into the slaves and into the into the, uh, and the ones, you know, to be sent to the gas ovens. Uh, and then, you know, it became 3,000 a day in every single camp. And there were about, of these camps of that scale, there were about six or seven. So the scale of production of death became something that was, you know, very exaggerated. Yeah, so, it was an uh, industrialization what, of genocide. Yes. Now, what the Zionists, you know, are counting on is not bullets. Starvation. Bombs. Starvation. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they are keeping all the crossings closed intentionally because they're strategizing that this will continue that nobody's going to have the guts you know to stop them and they are counting upon starvation as a means of mass extermination because yeah. you know even you know they know the united states is not going to let them get away with you know and with an unlimited occupation of the gaza territory even the united states you know the other day you know saying that it should be a combination of uh of uh arab forces that would come in there to keep you know uh uh, the peace and to, to occupy the territory and keep it out of the control of Hamas and out of the control of the Zionist military. This is the United States, you know, ceasefire proposal. Okay. And most likely Saudi Arabia you know, would, would be the one to move in there. <laughs> See, so, I like, I don't get how Biden's then saying Hamas has agreed to that because, like, I don't know why Hamas would agree to. Um, Hamas is not agreeing. I mean, to I that. mean, I can see them agreeing to that. Having yes. other Arabs maybe be involved, but not the ones that they're likely no, going to choose. Because no, what no. it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be CC. It's going to be fucking. Uh, yeah. um, what's it? Uh, the Saudi Arabia. It's going to be fucking. It's not going to be the actual Arab countries they have any decent relations with. Yeah, it will be right. the it will be the proxies. Yeah, that's why Hamas has already announced that they will not not accept any sort of you know peacekeeping troops not of their choice and not even if they are arab troops they will not accept them yeah it has to be against like, them coming in yeah yeah 
So yeah, because it's like, why would they like the U.S. just saying Arabs? It's like, oh, what? Well, you're gonna bring the Tunisians in? Like, you're gonna be a bit more fucking like clear. Algerians, <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, they wouldn't bring the Algerians in. A revolution might go off. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, you know, like, oh my, 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 my. Yeah. So. But yeah, okay, it's so like... uh, you know, once famine takes hold, and it is taking hold, then it is like mass extermination as much as the death camps were mass extermination. the The reason for the death camps was just you know to hide it from the public, so the public would accept it. You know, like all of a sudden, you know, all the Jewish apartments, you know, were empty. And so all of their goods in the apartments were looted. But they weren't looted by individuals, you know, because it was it was claimed to be the property of the state, of the German Nazi state. So all the uh, all the furniture and everything else, you know, was taken to a depot. And then the citizens were invited to come and buy the furniture at a discount price. And everybody was happy. <laughs> you know, like they didn't think about, you know, the Jewish people going off to a death camp. No. No, that wasn't, you know, yeah. Like, I mean, the even though the anti Semitism, even though the anti Semitism was very blatant, they kept the death camps on the down low, like for sure, because know. that would, you know, that would be stronger a stronger human reaction than the anti Semitism that they were carrying. You know, like there are certain autom autonomic, you know, reactions the fear of death, the, the you know, just, you know, death, you know, sets people into a you know, bad mood, so you know, they didn't want that, so they hit it. And then they concealed the evidence as well by the burning. Do you now, think the the Zionists Israel... don't? The Zionists are proud to be doing what they're doing. It's incredible, you know. Like in that way, you know, the mentality is worse than the Nazis. Do you think that the um, the Zionists are kind of used to the like? I mean, the government, not the military, because I know members of the military have been like posting TikToks and stuff of them being genocidal. But the government, do you think they're kind of used to like it being either a the last century or b because Palestine is poor that there's a less of a chance that they're gonna be like hooked up on the World Wide Web in their mindset because they seem to underestimate the third world people's ability and just in general the lower classes' ability to get a hold of shit when we need shit we'll find a way whether it's getting it cheap whether it's getting an old thing that might not yeah. be the best but it does the damn job or yeah. any of the above um yeah. you know like because it seems like they expected yeah. nothing to really get out other than what journalists might get a hold of and they've yeah. been buggered because palestinian people have managed to get shit out there um, yeah. Though I think they got Elon Musk to shut down Starlink for people in pa pa Palestine, so that cut off a lot of people for the internet. Yeah, but um, did you hear about the kid uh, who uh, used a uh, propeller from uh, probably yeah. uh, some machine or other and uh, set it up with a, a generator, a small generator that produced current that would be used to uh, recharge, you know, mobile phones. And people would come and recharge their mobile phone at this, you know, wind generator. And uh, that's how he, he made it, you know, he would barter, you know, and that's how he would live. <laughs> and so it people had access. Like, the way he made it, I, it was like running, like, through a battery as like a capacitor. So, like, oh. it was actually kind of smart because because a capacitor is really good for stabilizing your electricity because you don't want just any old sort of signal. But if you know this is 12.5 volts at 3 amps, yeah. then you've got something that you can work with there. So that is really fucking smart. Although I think his original contraption was way less power than 12. <laughs> That's a, less, a, a lot of power for a little turbine. I think he yeah. only had like, it was only like a few double A's worth of power. It was probably yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Um, it would take so long, you know, to charge a phone. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Like six volts at like 1.2 amps, maybe something like that. <laughs> yeah. So like not very much power at all, but enough. That, I mean, you need five volts to, to, to kick charge on a phone. I don't know. I think it's like three amps usually, but I think 1.2 amps is actually still enough to slow wow. charge a phone. Wow. So it should still work regardless. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. um, it, it's, it it's a uh, crafty use of stuff. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, we've been recording for 49 minutes now. I guess Ahmed is uh, not able to join us today. He'll probably jump into the here and now tomorrow with Steve. So uh, uh, let's uh, 
consider the coming week and what conclusion we can come to. And uh, this coming week is going to be the International Court of Justice and International Criminal Court proceedings to indict uh, Netanyahu and gang and uh, to uh, call for the end of the occupation by the occupation of the West Bank of 6 and 7. That's going to be called for an end to. So there, you know, the UN can send in peacekeeping troops into the West Bank there and uh, push the military out and uh, keep the uh, squatters at bay. But that's only the potential, the potential of such decisions. Then the uh, United Nations has to get into it, you know, and sign peacekeeping troops and all that can be vetoed still by the United States and the Security Council. But the General Assembly can overrule the veto in the Security Council, even though it's never been done, it can still be done. So we have that to look forward to as well. And the, yeah. you know, the encampments at the universities have been shut down here in Canada as well, in Toronto just lately, and in uh, McGill University here just lately as well. But they have to move into taking on the war production. I think you're very correct there. Uh, yes, the, uh, and we need like a coalescence of all these different forces doing different uh, things because we also yeah, need but, encampments yeah. to shut down the major cities because the big shutdown of the major cities would be one of the best things we can do. Like mm -hmm. that would really stick it to them. They've got to do something about it then and what? They're going to crack heads in the most like phone, uh, cell phone sensitive places in the entire fucking mm -hmm. world. You're going to mm. be filmed everywhere. Everyone's going to be talking about it. And once we're out of prison, we'll go back to fucking shutting your shit down again, motherfucker. Mm. I, I, I wish just the fucking universities would have that mindset. Like, uh, you know, if you've been kicked off and your camp has been shut down and you all ain't arrested, coalesce somewhere else, yeah. build something up more. You're going to get attacked again, but you're going to solidify. It's terrifying, I know, but we've got to keep this movement go and we can't let ourselves be trampled underfoot. And the unions are coming into the United Front with the students now. Students in unions together. Yeah, man. That's the way to go. Okay. That was how Birmingham uh, City, uh, like um, the encampment there at the Birmingham City University, the one that was shut down by the police on the 11th of July. Mm. Um, they, uh, they, their encampment was formed with uh, within a coalition between um, uh, socialists and communists in the university working with the the uh, what's it the CWU um, union um, uh, and that's it so they coalesced uh, with each other and the uh, Birmingham like unions uh, that were also involved in it that I've forgotten the name of were also a part of this uh, setup thingy I actually mm. missed the conference that they were going to have because someone mm. was like Oh, you want to go to the um, encampment? I'm about to get a Uber there, and I was like, "Ah, oh, I'm gonna go to the encampment." It was like what sit in a co conference room on a really, really hot summer's day and feel like I am dying, mm -hmm. or feel like I'm dying in the hot summer's day, but be in an encampment with revolutionary people doing revolutionary things. I'm like, "Yo, yeah. now I'm going to my encampment." <laughs> <laughs> and the encampment can, of course, put on its own conferences and its own schools and its own broadcasting can do everything there. You know, yeah, they were open mic and I should have gone up and like spoke. But I was like, I I, I was just, it was my first time at that encampment. So I just sort of stood <laughs> back a bit. But I might also get a bit too fiery for them because I'll start yeah. like fucking I'll start going off like a car bomb, pun intended. Uh <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't tell the you Irish, the she gets us anywhere and we start scaring the British. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't tell you about the encampment that I made in 1982 on Parliament Hill in front of the government building in, in Ottawa, Canada, while I was working at the Palestine Embassy against the war <laughs> and writing the book on Sabra Shatila. <laughs> Excuse me. We had an encampment there against the U.S. testing of cruise missile in Western Canada during the winter to simulate Arctic conditions so that they could attack the USSR from the north over the North Pole. So I had a peace camp there against cruise missile testing in Canada. And it got like 80% public support and lasted two years. And I lived there, slept there, and worked there for eight months of my own, you know, until other people came to keep it going. The encampment, oh, you know, yeah. and then after we got arrested and they 
invented a charge, you know, because they couldn't, it was public park, you know, because of the commons, you know, during the English revolution, all the crown lands were taken over by the public and turned into the commons. So this, you know, was no longer crown lands. It was public lands. And so on Parliament Hill, I could go there, you know, because it was a public park and there was a little plaque and metal on the bottom of a lamppost there as well, you know, that I used as proof when I went to court. And then got convicted. Yeah, but the conservative government, you know, passed an order in council, not even a law, just an order in council modifying the Public Works Act to forbid nuisances on Parliament Hill. And they called me a nuisance. And they called the nuisance regulation. And so uh, that I took to the Federal Court of Appeal. And the appeals court said, no, 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 no. You know, like you can put up, you know, could protest there whenever you want. It's a public park. You know, you could put up a literature table even if you want, you know. But just don't put up a tent. Don't, you know? So I, I had a partial victory there. Anyway. Just take, they, they didn't say you couldn't take a sleeping bag and sleep under the stars, though, you know. That's fucking. true. I've done that. <laughs> I've done that. When they tore down our tent, I went back after I was released from prison. And I just slept in a sleeping bag there and stayed. And put up a literature table. And so they freaked out and started to rip the literature table out of my hands, you know, and this is all recorded by the media. <laughs> Cross Canada coverage, you know, it was beautiful. And it's what we need right now is that sort of level of dedication. Like, yeah. God, fuck, like, I need an operation doing, but once I'm operated on, like, I would really like to try and see if I can get some of the fucking more radical communist dogs to, like, try and reach out to other leftist groups and see if we can, like, get something going on of, like, some form of encampment system that breaks free of the restrictions of universities not only for the limited amount that they're going to be able to get done but the limited will to get shit done that we've kind of seen with their willingness to shut shit down and i don't mean this for every university like i say birmingham university really wanted to get stuff done they were still holding out and there were still others that were holding out but like a lot of them are like oh they talk they, they said they'll talk to us about it let's shut hmm. down our encampment and it's like y'all uh fucking like Ignorant. Yeah, well, okay, they shut down the encampment, you know, but there's things to do. You know, we even occupied the president's office at York University one time when we were called the United yeah. Left Slate. We were united in front of all the leftists on the campus and we, we won the student elections <laughs> and uh, and uh, and we occupied the president's office <laughs> during that year as well, you know, <laughs> over something or other, you know, like I forget what it was even. I have a letter from the, from the president, you know, back there framed, you know, saying that... Uh, he agreed to our demands. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I love the fact you framed it. That's beautiful. <laughs> of course. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I insisted upon a letter, written statement, you know, like verbal is not good enough. No. <laughs> Just like Hamas is oh now asking God. for all the ceasefire to be written down. You know, they're not going to accept, you know, any sort of promises like like USSR accepted the promises of NATO not to expand. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, not only should they get it written down, but they also like even if they get their demands. Don't stop protesting. Universities have a lot of influence in society. You know, you just got something. You've got to be their biggest fear. You've given them something and now they want more. Be like that, you know, yeah. like it, it's, you know, they haven't jumped the gun. They've asked the sort of immediate demands within their own space so to get their own space to dislocate. Well, it's kind of like the analogy that um, I can't remember if it was Lenin or Marx. I think it was Marx who talked about this. He said it was like, um, you know, when the um, when there was no set sort of hours that you would be able to work in the day, and the worker was fighting for the 10 hour day, while realistically you could argue that they should be fighting for the eight hour day, mm. it still made more sense to fight for the 10 hour day, the, mm. the, you know, the more likely one that they were going to end up getting. But mm. it also was justified for workers to be really displeased with the 10 hour day, the moment they got it and to start fighting then for the eight hour day. Mm. And so like, once you've gotten them to divest and you've gotten that, it's still not satisfying enough. Yeah. Universities influence governments. They influence uh, politicians. Mm -hmm. You want sanctions 
Oh, it's almost like there's a there's a there's a um, three letters that sort of correspond to something or another of <laughs> BDS. BDS is that is that what it's BDS? Oh yes, I remember Maybe. BDS. Yeah, yeah. You sure Omar, you don't mean Omar Bragueti? Uh, Omar Bragueti, you know who uh, who pushed that campaign? Uh, I interviewed him. And there's a video of him on my channel as well somewhere. But uh, you know, at the time few years back you know it was in uh, ramallah the demonstration that i interviewed him and uh, i i said to him you know i noticed that the uh, you know support for bds is growing amongst the general public but it is being dissed you know it's being uh, put down and and uh, denounced you know even more and more you know by the uh, by the state structures and he says yes that's the way it's going you know basically you know revolutionary process yeah yeah and it's like you know BDS is so fucking important to be like international. It's got to be for everyone. And we got to really fucking push against the fucking Zionist law, the fascist law, like, mm -hmm. and really put a foot in the floor for this. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Like, if a two state solution, which isn't a solution, somehow gets fucking forged. People shouldn't be just going, okay, no more Palestinian protests. Let's go back to branch. So long as Israel exists, Palestine is not safe. Mm -hmm. Like, so we need to be supporting the, whatever the hell the Palestinian Liberation Front, uh, like, you know, is the direction for them as they go forward, you know, like the, the Intifada. Because Intifada revolution is a really, really important facet of struggle. Uh, yeah. You know, a jihad is like absolutely like a big future forward for the Palestinian people. Because if they do mm. not have that struggle, if mm. they do not have that jihad, then they will never be, they, they won't be free. And then if they're not free, we're not free. And the Palestinian people know this, you know, that's why mm. they took that term that the fucking Zionists invented to, uh, during the 60s, uh, the from the river to the sea. Mm. And they twisted it against them for freedom, for revolution, mm. for, for liberation. And mm. so many of the protesters here have gotten that well. Like so many people have been getting right into the chance of telling the colonizers to fuck off, you mm. know, like saying that this like colonial state, this shit needs to fucking like mm. get the fuck out The you know, Palestine is Palestinian from the river to the sea and all that other stuff is being not only said, but said in a way where it's unambiguous mm. about the nature of, you know, the, the Zionist, uh, state days on numbered. Yes, but not so quickly, you know. Um, there's a, a misappreciation of how difficult the struggle is going to be. And the Intifada, that, as it is conceived of uh, presently, is a defeatist Intifada. Because I've been through many Intifadas. Yes. 87, 2000. And what happens is that, you know, the Zionists, they, they kill off, you know, the the... The, the activists, you know, in, in, in that intifada, a thousand, two thousand, and then the intifada stops. Okay. Now, the intifada has been defined, you know, in two limited terms, and it results in such a um, defeatist, you know, position as a result, you know, because it's, uh, it's you know, like a, a sentiment, you know, it says we will resist even if it means that we're going to die. Okay, fine. But it doesn't go beyond being defeated even though it is still resistance. So Intifada has to be redefined, you know, to be a broader phenomenon than it has been conceived to be. Yes. Because it is a very, you know, like elementary, uh, you know, like lacking of organization, you know, in the Palestinian civil society. I'll give you one example that can be a strategic front of an offensive. And that is the Palestinian workers who have permits to go and work inside of the Zionist state, you know, inside 48 territory. You know, the number is 160,000 that go in there yes. every day. They don't have a union. When the uh, PLO government, the Palestinian Authority, calls a general strike, you know, because, you know, there's a massacre or something like that, all the shops are closed. But the 160,000 workers, they continue to go and work inside 48 territory. Why? You know, can't they organize themselves? A general strike means a general strike. 
You know, like instead of hurting yourself, you know, by shutting down shops and, and not allowing people to, you know, to live their lives, you know, why not shut down the Zionist economy? Because that's what it's dependent upon. There's 160,000, you know, Palestinian workers, plus another 40,000 that work internally in the West Bank, building the squatter cities there for the for the squatters. Yeah. They're building the houses there, not the squatters. No. Getting paid fuck all to do it as well. Yeah. Um, the thing with the Intifada that is the concern is the bourgeoisie are at the leadership again, Hamas. Mm. And Hamas has shown opportunism a lot throughout the movement. It's why I don't like the people that are like, support Hamas like unconditionally. It's like, you don't ever support anyone like just like without it. Like you don't put conditions on it. Like, but unconditional support doesn't mean you don't analyze and criticize who you are dealing with because conditions is a little different than criticisms. Like if you're going to put conditions on someone, just like you're not even in this conversation, like piss off, you know, like because that's not for us to do. It's their struggle, not ours. But we have to be critical and we have to know that like in an intifada where there's literally two of the like the biggest communist organizations in the entire country that have been active since the 60s are in this intifada and they're not the leadership that's mm. like the concern we have now it's good that they're in it they're, they're helping push it to be more radical and the pflp their announcements and stuff have been very big on the revolutionary front of things I, i'm liking the the their their uh their, their big pushes to try and influence the left in um like uh places like europe and america to try and push for demands like they ain't mm. fucking about. They they're dropping it clean and clear, and in a in a way that's like fucking like hell yeah. They got their heads screwed on. Problem is, is like when you have like an opportunist like Hamas in control, they could shut shit down. Like they could become the leader of this supposed like Palestinian like um state that um Israel is claiming. That they they've agreed already uh, to uh, form a, a government of national reconciliation in which they would be participants. You know, but they wouldn't be dominant. So they want a, a you know, <laughs> front coalition government. They've con they've made concessions, big concessions, you know, to uh, but but, uh, but they, they, been they, they will be involved, but not too massively though. It's just a line that just fucking cracks me up. They're like, "Oh, we're gonna give you your own government." Well, eh, we kind of gonna give you sort of your own government. I like, don't worry about it. Yeah, but the, the political dynamics, of course, mean that. Uh, you know, the, the party that is doing something, you know, become the leadership, you know, and, and those who are not doing anything, you know, are disregarded, you know, and discarded that in the next opportunity. Yeah, yeah that's so, so like the bourgeoisie is going to have an ability to try and shut the intifada down completely uh, mm -hmm. um, with this two state solution stuff. Like, so there definitely needs to be with the DFLP and the PFLP and um, a lot of the other organizations that are involved in there that aren't as powerful. There's as, about like, seven. Yeah. yeah uh, that, that, that aren't as sort of like powerful as like um, Hamas is on the bourgeois side of things. Because even some of the other bourgeois organizations are less likely to turn cult on the movement like this. Um, but the, what's it? It's... um. The uh, they need to be steadfast in staying true to it, and I hope Hamas does. I just like I'm not gonna lie to myself and like act like the 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 the, the there's a definite hood to them doing so. But I would hope that they would have learned their lesson and hold true to the principles that Palestine must be free. But um, mm -hmm. history speaks louder than my hopes in that regard. Yes, well, it's a. Uh... It's difficult to conceive of the bourgeoisie being inside Hamas. <laughs> Maybe, I doubt it. But within Fatah, yeah. They even have their own village, you know, with a, a tree-lined uh, entranceway coming off of the main highway that you can pass, you know, as you're going to uh, travel from Nablus to Ramallah. There they are with these palm tree-lined uh, entranceway to the... Uh, to the city or villa or village that they have there, you know, that that's where all the functionaries live, you know, together with the bourgeoisie. And then they built their own city as well on top of, in addition to that, you know, they've got another place called Ro Rowada or something. 
And I went to visit it, you know, and it's these all these apartment towers all over the place, empty, with no windows, because nobody can rent them. So they don't finish them off. And then in the center is, you know, like uh, tourist stuff. But people come there, you know, to hang out, you know, because it looks Western and it's Palestinian, so it's cute. That's about it. You know, that's about as far as the Palestinian Authority has gotten. Anyway, it's difficult to yeah. conclude. Huh? There's so much to talk about. <laughs> well, it's like, fuck, especially when you're getting into like the weird dynamics of it all, because you bring the Palestinian Authority into it. And it's like, well, um, uh, regarding their what they've done for the movement. You know, it's more about what, the, you know, it's easier to talk about what the Palestinian Authority does for the struggle because it's, it's it, there's a lot to talk about if you talk about what they don't do. Like, mm. holy fuck. You know, like, Fatah themselves, like, fuck. Like, for all the problems that they've ever had throughout their history, they used to be so much more radical. <laughs> like, they have turned into the most, like, wet fart of an organization that I've ever fucking, uh, like, seen in the middle of, like, a, a like a colonized situation. Like, they, they went from... And, and there's still definitely going to be some people in their lower ranks that are pretty radically minded people, but it doesn't matter. Like, the, the organization has long become this statesman, we do whatever the Israelis say we're allowed to do organization mm -hmm. that abandoned the 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 plo and its principles mm -hmm. um yeah. you know and then you have um with hamas as well they are bourgeois but they originally started off as a petty bourgeois reaction to the plo and its power within gaza mm. Mm. um yeah abu mazen you know is uh useless he doesn't do anything doesn't do anything at all. Some of the diplomats are great. The UN diplomat uh, spokesperson, uh, forgetting his name at the moment, but he's he's uh, dynamic. He's insistent. You know, he's uh, he gets angry, but he he also like practically cries in front of the General Assembly in order to get and Security Council rather in order to get sympathy. You know, like hopeless strategy. You know, crying <laughs> really. The what's it? The Palestinians showing their similarities to the Irish and the weird two-state solution problems and where the like these issues uh -huh. lead to. Uh, the Palestinian Authority is very much like the Irish Free State. You know, it's the you know you got your own government, you're free. You know, you're your own thing. Mm -hmm. Except, well, we own you, and like, well, we own your seas, we own everything around you. And you kind of control by us. Also, we're just going to start up some shit in your land. I hope you don't mind. And like, but even though their government is a load of fucking like wank compared to like, you know, for the Palestinian people, it does fuck all um, mm -hmm. to really be a worthwhile entity, just like the fucking uh, the Irish fucking free state. The, the people we send to the other places like the EU or the UN seem to just be so much better. Like the fucking shit that we've been yelling down at the EU about genocide oh. and stuff is just, it, uh, and like our emotion and passion for it mirrors exactly the same as what the, the, the minister for the UN from Palestine brings to the table. And so yeah. it's that interconnectivity of our struggles and just as well, how you can so similarly like, relate these dynamics and you know what was what 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 goes on um in so many colonies around the world the british were testing on us first and it's oh, just yeah, yeah. turned into worse things mm -hmm. as they've managed to make genocide more industrializable uh more domineering more international and like it, this is the fucking the evil that the fucking brits were pulling down on my own people but on an even more exacerbated level like, you know, the genocide in the 1800s um, would be a time I would really link this to is that sort of just like outright decimation of our peoples. Yeah. They were paying Irish mothers to not teach their kids Irish, make sure yeah. their kids knew not a, not a sick of Irish, like, you know, not a, not a, not a That's word. That's like what the Zionists did against Yiddish. My Yiddish, you know, like I can't speak with anybody. Nobody speaks Yiddish. You know, even when I was at the vigil, you know, like Chassidim, you know, I would speak with them in Yiddish. Maybe, maybe they would understand, you know, what I was saying. But they couldn't answer. They couldn't answer me in Yiddish, you know, like, you know, Zionists, you know, have destroyed the Jewish culture. 
And they've set up this artificial sort of Americanist, uh, it's, it's America that they've set up there. It's not Jewish. Yeah, it's uh, it even uses America's like fucking Judeo Christianity uh, thing. Um, yeah, like, Protestant, uh, you know, Holy Land shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not to get confused with like the early like pro pre Christian Christians because they th mm. that term would mean something else for them. They were basically just Hebrew like yeah. peoples and were religiously still tied to the Jewish faith. Um, yeah. Judeo, uh, like, because there's a. Uh, um, I was speaking with a comrade who's like really immersed on religion. He was explaining like, uh, like to that it's always good to contrast the differences because some people might get confused. Um, to explain, America made its own little special version of this stuff that comes from European, um, like nonsense. British yeah. Israelism is a version of it where yeah. uh, they believe that they're part of the Holy Lands. So British Israelism, they believe that the Anglo Saxons. Mm. Uh, somehow actually uh, one tribe of israel and i'm like how did you get that the anglo-saxons was made of four different germanian tribes you absolute <laughs> dipshits and then the normans too like are they lost <laughs> yeah it's, really they went the wrong like direction <laughs> You know, it's like how uh, someone tried to tell me that, like, the English were a descendant of the Romans. And I'm like, no, I, I mean, th th you'd stroke their ego if you told them that. Mm -hmm. But, like... Uh, <laughs> the level of education is rather pitiful and pathetic. Uh, oh, well, okay, here we are. We're ready to uh, to uh, change all that. And, uh, and so we conclude for today, and we will be back uh, next Saturday. For sure. Hell okay. yeah. Love and solidarity, people. All power. Yes. See, this is a big fist. It means it. Yeah. Mine are bigger than I'd like. <laughs> <laughs>